At around 10 o'clock at night, on February 25, 2011, two men living in the Nanhu Park area of Nanjing, a city in the eastern province of Jiangsu, received phone calls that were both concerning and confusing. Feng Jing, who worked as a security guard at a nearby vegetable market, answered his phone to a strange robotic voice. The person on the other end of the call said they'd taken his 15-year-old daughter Feng Ying, and if he didn't pay 3 million yuan, he'd never see her again. Only moments earlier, taxi driver Li Bin, who lived in the same neighborhood, received a call from someone with a similar robotic-sounding voice, demanding 1 million yuan for the safe return of his daughter, 16-year-old Bi Xiaoting. Both men were warned their daughter's lives would be ended if they went to the police. With a monthly salary of only 1,000 yuan, and his wife, Cao Huijuan, who worked at a car park toll booth earning only slightly more, Feng Jing knew there was no possibility of coming up with anything close to 3 million. Although the ransom demanded from Li Bin was significantly less, the possibility of getting his hands on 1 million yuan was equally unrealistic. The insane amounts of money mentioned left both men with a touch of skepticism about the call. At that time the district was known for being one of the older, poorest areas of Nanjing. Few people in the community would have anything approaching the ransom demands. The fathers began investigating the situation. Feng Jing always did the school run with his daughter. This particular afternoon however, she hadn't appeared at the school gate, but she sent him a message saying she'd be home late, as she was attending some after-school classes. Now when he tried calling, his daughter's phone was turned off. Getting increasingly worried, he went out into the neighborhood to ask his daughter's friends if they knew where she was. Li Bin was a taxi driver with little in the way of savings, so found it hard to believe that anyone who knew him could think he had one million yuan. Thinking it could be a sick prank by a fellow driver, he began making calls to question his colleagues. His daughter mostly lived with her grandparents. After separating from the girl's mother, he effectively abandoned her, leaving his family with the responsibility of raising Bi Xiaoting. His colleagues pled ignorance about the call, and his family hadn't seen or heard from the girl, so he tried contacting his ex-wife. The girl's mother, Chen Yin, who'd also been out of her life for many years, had recently returned to the district, and was trying to build a relationship with her daughter. While Li Bin was trying to contact Chen Ye, Feng Jing was going round the homes of his daughter's classmates. One girl, who was close friends with Feng Ying, told him there weren't any classes at the school that evening, but added that his daughter was going to attend a birthday party of another student, Li Xiaoting. Hearing this Feng Jing felt a touch of relief, but it didn't explain the phone call demanding a ransom, so he went to the home of Li Xiaoting, unaware she was also missing. Li Bin was having no luck in tracking his own daughter down or contacting his ex-wife, when Feng Jing knocked on his door. Both men were equally stunned to discover they were in the same situation, receiving almost identical phone calls. Feng Jing told Li Bin that the girls were supposedly celebrating his daughter's birthday together, but Li Bin knew nothing about this, only that it wasn't his missing daughter's birthday. Finally getting hold of Chen Ye. Li Bin asked if there was any truth to the story of a birthday party, but his ex-wife claimed she knew nothing about it. There was no birthday, and she hadn't seen or heard from their daughter. The two fathers felt they had no option other than to report the apparent kidnapping. But Chen Yin tried to talk them out of it, at least in the time being, very worried that the kidnappers would make good on their threats. With no possibility of coming up with anything close to the ransom demands, the fathers decided they had to inform the police. Eventually convincing her that they had no other option, Chen Ye agreed to come pick the men up and drive them to the police station. Along the way, Chen Ye suggested that she drop off Feng Jing at his home in case his daughter turned up, but he maintained that he wanted to report it in person. The two men went inside to report the incident, while Chen Ye returned home in case there was some news. At around 1 a.m. the two men were just leaving having made the report, when Chen Yin called them to say not to worry, the girls had returned and the ransom demands were just a stupid childish prank. They'd a big exam coming up but were too nervous to take it, so they ran away and made the calls to explain their disappearance.
Chen Yan told the men to tell the police that everything was fine. With both men feeling reassured, they apologized to police, explained what had happened and went back to the home of Yi Bin to wait for the girls. However, when she returned, the daughter of Feng Jing wasn't in the car. He immediately began to panic, demanding to know where his daughter was. Li Xiaoting admitted that they both ran away because they were too nervous to take the exam, but Feng Ning had taken the opportunity to go to the city of Yangzhou 100 kilometers away, to see her online boyfriend. Feng Jing and Cao Huijuan both found this hard to believe. After receiving the phone call demanding the ransom, they'd searched their daughter's room. Looking in the place she kept her money, they found it hadn't been taken. Feng Ning would have needed the money to travel, and they never had any suspicion that their daughter had an online boyfriend in Yangzhou or anywhere else. This didn't necessarily mean it wasn't true, but they felt it was very out of character for her. They logged onto her QQ social media account to check, and found there were no conversations with any boys and no mentions of Yang Zhou at all. Feeling that Li Xiaoting was lying, perhaps to protect Feng Ying from getting into trouble, the despairing parents begged the 16-year-old to tell them what was going on, and where their daughter was. Li Xiaoting remained resolute, continuing to tell the same story. They ran away because they didn't want to take the exam, they made the fake ransom demands because they were scared they'd get into trouble, and Feng Ning had gone to see a boy in Yangzhou. With their daughter still missing, Feng Jing and Cao Huijuan returned to the police station to report it, Li Bin and his daughter going along with them, while Chen Yan drove. As the Feng family, Li Bin and Li Xiaoting went inside, Chen Yan waited outside in the car. Police questioned Li Xiaoting, and she repeated the exact same story. However, something wasn't sitting right with the officers interviewing her. From the earlier report he made, Feng Jing had told police that another classmate said Li Xiaoting invited his daughter to a birthday celebration, but that hadn't been mentioned once by Li Xiaoting. When she was asked about this she denied having ever said it, but police had already taken a statement from the girl who told Feng Jing. Police also found it strange that Chen Ye, throughout the entire ordeal had never once stepped into the police station herself, even when she thought her daughter was missing. With the feeling that something was amiss, police told Yi Bi his daughter wasn't telling the full truth, and voiced their concerns about Chen Yin. The officers suggested he speak to them privately when they got home, and try to get the full truth out of his daughter. Knowing his ex-wife's history, Li Bin got a sinking feeling in the pit of his stomach. Shortly after the two families left the station, investigators went through the phone records of Chen Yin and Li Xiaoting. They found that the phone of Chen Yin hadn't made or received any calls the entire day, until Li Bin called to tell her about the ransom demands. Immediately after that, Chen Yin made a call to an untraceable number that lasted one minute. Knowing that he didn't have a close relationship with his daughter, having abandoned her at a young age, Li Bin knew he'd struggle to get the truth out of her. Instead he turned to other members of the family, in efforts to get the real story from his daughter. Again Li Xiaoting just repeated the same story over and over, Chen Yin getting increasingly flustered, angrily told them to stop the continuous questioning. The reaction of Chen Yin only made Li Bin believe the police were right to have suspicions about her. The rest of the family felt the same way and eventually a cousin, who had an especially close relationship with Li Xiaoting, took her into a different room and spoke with her away from the watchful eyes of her mother, ignoring the protests of Chen Yin. He told her, she needed to come clean, otherwise the family could do nothing to help her, and her life would be over. Finally, she broke down in tears, and confessed that her mother ended the life of Feng Ying, and told Li Xiaoting to keep it a secret to protect her. Li Xiaoting begged her cousin not to say anything yet, and give her mother a chance to run away. The cousin left the room shocked, and informed the family about the confession from Li Xiaoting, Chen Yan tried to run but was stopped by her ex-husband and the police were called. Chen Yan and her daughter were arrested, and police began the interrogations of the pair. However, despite admitting to her cousin that Chen Yan had ended the life of Feng Ying, Li Xiaoting now refused to confess. The interrogations would go on for hours, as both suspects refused to admit what had actually happened. Finding the car of Chen Yan became a major priority. 
Fortunately, it didn't take long for police to track the vehicle down, and once they opened the trunk they found out why Chen Yin didn't leave the car when driving the others to the police station. In the trunk there was a large suitcase, and on opening it police were greeted with the sight of the body of 15-year-old Feng Ying. Along with the body in the suitcase, police also found rope, rolls of tape, and empty bottles of what looked like some sort of sleeping medication. When officers interviewing the suspects learned of the discovery, they put the find to the pair, hoping the truth would eventually come out. It had taken six hours for Chen Yin to finally break and admit the truth about what happened, but her daughter Li Xiaoting, desperate to protect her mother continued to lie for nine hours, maintaining the story that Feng Ying went to meet a boy in Yangzhou. The 16-year-old student remained calm but resolute throughout her interrogation, showing little emotion or fear. Her sole focus was trying to keep her mother safe. Like many Chinese people at the time, Li Bing and Chen Yin got married far too young, still in their teens when they made the decision. The marriage was never actually official, both being under the age when people can legally marry in China, but they considered themselves husband and wife. Li Bing didn't have a great reputation around the town, he enjoyed gambling and was involved in petty crime, but Chen Yin was already a keen gambler herself, so his bad boy image didn't trouble her. Not long after getting together she became pregnant with Li Xiaoting and moved into the small cramped family home with three other generations of the Li family. But only five months after giving birth, Chen Yin deserted her baby daughter without a word, leaving the family home, and wouldn't return for 14 years. By his own admission, Li Bin at that time was far too immature and irresponsible to raise a child, especially as a single father, so the responsibility was taken on by his parents. He wouldn't see much of his daughter during her early childhood, but he eventually married again and changed his ways. He made efforts to live up to his parental responsibilities, moving back to Nanhu in an attempt to build a relationship with Li Xiaoting. Chen Ye on the other hand did not. She'd marry three more times, having two more children. Each of the marriages fell apart, with the children being abandoned due to her constant gambling, and now drug addiction. Even her own family wanted nothing to do with her. She'd run up huge debts through her gambling, only contacting her family to borrow money to pay them off. Eventually, the family tired of giving her money they'd never see again and cut her off. However, they'd now be troubled by the loan sharks Chen Yin borrowed from, to continue her gambling and drug abuse. Unsurprisingly, loan sharks in China aren't the most trusting of individuals, especially when lending money to gambling drug addicts, so they will demand ID numbers, addresses, and workplaces of family members of the debtor. If payments don't come on time, then the loan sharks will go after the family, turning up at their homes or places of employment looking for repayment. The family of Chen Yin would frequently have to deal with gangsters coming to their home looking for her, or some sort of payment on the debt, eventually having to hand over the deeds of their home as collateral. With her drug and gambling addiction, Chen Yin had built up sizable debts, and was running out of time. Having two absent parents had a major impact on the young Li Xiaoting, which would become more noticeable once she started school. While her classmates would frequently talk about their parents, Li Xiaoting couldn't do the same, so she constructed a fantasy world to fit in. Embarrassed that she had no parents to talk about with her peers, she began to tell people that her parents were rich, doing business around the world and lived in Australia. However, in the small community gossip quickly spread, and her peers knew she was lying. The lies and fantasy world she constructed meant other kids didn't trust her, and she had few close friends as a result. Her teachers would later describe her as a polite, respectful girl, who never showed any behavioral issues, and worked hard in classes. But as she aged, classmates would humor themselves by asking her about her supposedly rich parents, her frequent trips overseas, or her extravagant life, laughing about her behind her back. In 2008 Chen Yin returned home completely out of the blue, and seemingly tried to build a relationship with her daughter, the one thing the young girl wanted more than anything in the world. 
The Di family were less than happy with her return, and were extremely concerned about her motives. But seeing how happy it made Li Xiaoting, they held their tongues and allowed Chen Yan to stay in their home, constantly wary of the prodigal mother. Feng Jing and Cao Huijun were the polar opposites to Li Bin and Chen Ye. They did everything they could to ensure Feng Ning had as good an upbringing as possible. When their daughter was only four years old, she was diagnosed with a congenital heart issue which required surgery. The medical insurance they had wasn't enough to cover the full cost of the treatment. Consequently, they had to use their life savings to pay the hospital bills. Shortly after this, Feng Jing was laid off from his fairly stable factory job, and the printing company which employed Cao Huijun closed down. Practically bankrupt, the couple took whatever jobs they could find to pay off their debt from the medical bills and support their daughter. With the health issues Feng Ying experienced, they made sure to provide her with as healthy a life as possible. Feng Jing would wake at 4.30 every morning, head to the local market to buy fresh food, wanting to make sure his daughter got three nutritious meals a day. He used his breaks in his security guard job to pick her up from school, cook her a meal, take her back to school before heading back to work, often leaving little free time for himself. Such was his devotion to his daughter. People who knew Feng Jing described him as a man without hobbies. His sole focus in life was trying to give his daughter the best life he could. Since returning to Nanhu, Chen Yin had given off the appearance of someone who was genuinely trying to turn over a new leaf. She was spending a lot of time with her daughter, and the young girl had never been happier. But as time went on, the already wary Li family were getting increasingly concerned about the influence Chen Yin was having over Li Xiaoting. The young girl was neglecting her studies, only going to school two days a week, preferring to spend as much time as she could with her mother. She just wanted Chen Yin in her life, and worried that she'd be abandoned again, Li Xiaoting was prepared to do anything to keep her mother around. After six hours of interrogation, and being presented with the evidence of the body being found in the car she'd rented, Chen Yin finally confessed and gave the police the whole story. The debts she'd run up from gambling and drug use were now getting close to totaling one million yuan, and the loan sharks wanted repayment, one way or another. She'd long since exhausted any goodwill from family, and had few friends to turn to for help. However, one person she knew would do anything for her was Li Xiaoting. Chen Ye explained the trouble she was in, and told her daughter she needed money fast or very bad people would come for her. Li Xiaoting had previously mentioned that there was a girl in her class whose family had money. She believed this because the family had their own business and had recently bought a new car. Chen Ye had remembered her daughter's words and came up with a scheme she hoped could pay off her debts. She told Li Xiaoting they were going to kidnap the girl, hold her for ransom, and when the family paid the money let her go. Li Xiaoting was told she needed to get the girl to come to a hotel after school. She was hesitant about the plan, until her mother said if she didn't help, they'd never see each other again. Willing to do anything for her mother's love, she agreed to help. Chen Yan spent the next days preparing, buying a suitcase, rope, rolls of tape, prescription sleep medication, two burner phones that had voice changing software installed, and rented a car. The girl they targeted was the person who would later inform Feng Jing that Feng Ying went to a birthday party when he was searching for his daughter. Li Xiaoting approached the girl, telling her she was going to Australia with her mother, and so was having a birthday party before she left, inviting the girl to attend. The girl didn't particularly trust Li Xiaoting, knowing she often lied and boasted of her parents' supposed wealth. She turned down the invitation, thinking it strange she was asked, since they were never friends. The refusal didn't deter Li Xiaoting and thinking about her mother, she turned to Feng Ying, who was friends with the original girl targeted. Li Xiaoting and Feng Ying were not friends, in fact Li Xiaoting knew little about her or her family, but since she hung out with the other girl, she wrongly assumed that the family of Feng Ying must also have money. Feng Ying agreed to go, despite the other girl telling her to be wary of what Li Xiaoting said. The two girls left together at the end of the school day, 
excited at the prospect of the extravagant party Li Xiaoting had described. Thinking her father may not agree with her attending the party, Feng Ning sent him the message saying she would be late home from school. They went to a private room in the restaurant of a hotel where Chen Yan was waiting. Chen Yan took her opportunity when Feng Ning excused herself to go to the bathroom. She mixed a significant amount of the sleeping medication into the girl's drink. It didn't take long for the 15-year-old to fall into unconsciousness, and Chen Yin carried the girl unseen out of the back door, placing her into the trunk of the rental car. She drove to a secluded location in the Purple Mountain area of Nanjing, ready to put the next part of the plan into action. In their rush to put the unconscious hostage in the car, they hadn't taken her phone to get her father's number to make the ransom demand. Chen Ye opened the trunk to retrieve the phone, then with the tape she'd purchased earlier she went to blindfold and gag Feng Ning. While she was doing this, Feng Ning woke suddenly. Terrified and confused she began screaming for help. Chen Ye managed to place some tape over her hostage's mouth, but the young girl fought back, tearing the tape away and tried to get out of the car. Chen Ye responded by placing her hands around the neck of Feng Ning and began choking her. Li Xiaoting, seeing her mother struggle, joined and helped hold the girl down as Feng Ying fought with all her strength, but the life would eventually be choked out of her. When Li Xiaoting saw her schoolmate stop moving, she asked her mother if Feng Ying was dead. Chen Ye ignored the question and told her daughter to help stuff the body into the suitcase. Using one of the burner phones with the voice changing software, she first called Li Bin and made the ransom demand. This was just to confuse any potential investigation, and she didn't think he cared enough about Li Xiaoting to report it to the police. She then called Feng Jing and made the demand for 3 million yuan. Wrongly believing him to be wealthy, she thought he'd pay the money without question and wouldn't risk reporting it. She drove back to Nanhu and the hotel. She left her daughter there to maintain the charade she'd been kidnapped before attempting to dispose of the body. Her original plan was to hide the suitcase in a family tomb in the countryside on the outskirts of the city. However, when she called a family member to help her open the tomb, with the bizarre excuse that her uncle had asked her to go there and look for something he'd lost, the relative point blank refused. The tradition in the area was that tombs were never to be opened at night, only during daylight hours. Her plan stubborn, she tried to come up with another way to get rid of the evidence in the trunk of her car. That's when she found out that she'd vastly underestimated her ex-husband. After receiving the call where Li Bin told her that he and Feng Jing were going to report the missing girls, she made the one-minute call to Li Xiaoting, telling her to get rid of the phones they were using, and to stick to the story they planned in advance. Seeing how seriously the two fathers were taking it, and realizing she needed to do something to prevent the police from looking at her too closely, she used her daughter to protect her. Li Xiaoting returned and began telling the fake story of not wanting to take the exam, and Feng Ning going to see a boy in Yangzhou, which she repeated devotedly in an attempt to protect her mother. It had taken six hours to finally get the truth out of her, but during the interrogation, Chen Ye would make one last attempt to save herself from the death sentence facing her. She claimed that her 16-year-old daughter had been the one to choke Feng Ning, saying that Li Xiaoting was angry with her classmate for bullying her. With the interrogation of Li Xiaoting reaching the nine-hour mark, in an effort to finally stop her protecting her mother, police told her that Chen Ye had said she was responsible for the death of Feng Ying. Perhaps it was with this, she was suddenly hit with the realization that her mother didn't care for her at all, and was just using her, so she finally admitted the truth. When police had to inform Feng Jing and Cao Huijuan of their daughter's death, the news devastated them but it hit Feng Jing especially hard. He was distraught of the thought that every time he'd been in the car with Chen Ye, his daughter was lying dead, stuffed in a suitcase right behind him. On hearing the news, he passed out and fell to the floor of the police station. A man who'd never smoked a cigarette his entire life suddenly began chain-smoking, and in the weeks after, his health and behavior would become an increasing concern. He'd suffer frequent panic attacks, going days without speaking. He tore curtains in his home into strips, 
obsessively burning holes into the material with his cigarettes. On one occasion, Cao Huijun remembered him bringing all of his clothes into the lounge and setting them alight. He would fly into rages, smashing furniture and his television. People around the community would see him walking the streets, screaming that he was going to end someone's life. Fortunately, he had a loving wife and family, and plenty of friends in the community who stopped him from falling down an abyss. They did whatever they could to support the man, and eventually convinced him to see a doctor. He was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. With treatment, medication, and the support he received, his condition improved over time, and he began to deal with his daughter's death, as well as someone can. On November 11, 2011, Chen Ye and Li Xiaoting went on trial. Chen Ye was facing charges of kidnapping and intentional homicide. However, the Li family and Feng family came to an agreement before the trial. Feng Jing and Cao Huijuan forgave Li Xiaoting for her role in their daughter's death, viewing her as a child who was manipulated by her mother. As a result, she would only face charges of being an accomplice to the crime. There was no such forgiveness towards Chen Ye. Naturally, the Feng family petitioned the court for her to receive the death penalty, and they were joined by both the Li and Chen families. In keeping with her character, Chen Ye would make one final attempt to weasel her way out of taking responsibility. She claimed the death of Feng Ning was just a tragic accident, and she'd never intended for it to happen. However, that was easily dismissed when she had no reasonable explanation for the purchase of the suitcase, and she admitted she'd pre-planned hiding the body in her family tomb. Chen Ye was sentenced to death, and Li Xiaoting was handed a nine-year prison sentence. Chen Ye was executed not long after being sentenced with no one sad to see her gone. She never apologized to the Feng family and never showed any remorse for what she'd done. Feng Jing and Cao Huijun eventually would get on with rebuilding their lives. Li Bi, however, would struggle with his own sense of guilt for the death of Feng Ying. He blamed himself for not being there for his daughter in her formative years, and felt he needed to do something for the Feng family in the way of an apology, knowing nothing he could do could ever come close to being enough. He sold his own home for 250,000 yuan, which he tried to give to Feng Jing, not looking for some kind of forgiveness but hoping it could at the least help cover the medical bills for the treatment and medication Feng Jing required. Feng Jing refused the offer. There was no bitterness towards Li Bin, and Feng Jing didn't place any blame on him. He simply said, his daughter was dead, and even 25 million wouldn't make any difference to him. If the case had faded from people's minds, then it was brought back to wider public attention in the 2020 film, Tu Zi Bao Li which translates to rabbit violence, using the case as inspiration for its plot. The renewed interest in the case brought about by the release of the movie had many people curious about the fate of Yi Xiaoting. Given that she was a minor at the time of her conviction, it is difficult to find any verifiable information about her current situation. However, it is likely that today Yi Xiaoting has been released from prison having served her sentence. She would no doubt have been given a new identity, and so the opportunity to build some kind of life for herself. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please consider giving it a like, leaving a comment, and subscribing to the channel. And hope to see you again for the next dark tale from the Middle Kingdom.